This is part two of a series about the strong possibility of life on other worlds of our solar system. We know that life got started quickly on Earth because of its underwater volcanoes. In this video, we'll look at what happened. We know it happened here, plus it could have happened anywhere the conditions are the same. We also now know that many life forms can live happily in the extremely hot conditions of the early Earth. If they can do that here, then they could do it wherever those conditions exist elsewhere. This opens up a lot of places we previously didn't consider as serious candidates for life. Earth was not very hospitable when it first formed. You wouldn't have recognized it, nor would you have wanted to live there. For starters, it was very hot. The reason concerns the way planets form. Stars and planets begin as clouds of gas and dust. Tiny particles join up to form bigger and bigger particles. The larger they get, the more pulling power they have. So the early solar system quickly switched from dust and gas drifting around to great mountain-sized or larger chunks of rock smashing into each other at high speeds. These collisions released energy. During the Earth's early formation, it was struck an uncountable number of times with very high energy impacts. The Moon's surface preserves evidence of that violent period in the solar system's history. Incidentally, the Moon itself formed as a result of one extremely large impact which also knocked Earth off its upright rotation. Each impact gave the young Earth more energy, so much that the planet was molten throughout its early phase. Life then would have been completely impossible. Earth was too hot. So life could not have arisen until the intense impact phase was over. If life had evolved, large later impacts would have sterilized the Earth again. In the same way that after a storm there is one last raindrop, finally the bombardment did end. That was about 4 billion years ago. The Earth started to cool to form a solid crust. We also know that the oldest rocks on Earth having confirmed fossils are about 3.5 billion years old. That gives a window when life could have arisen of half a billion years. However, we're confident life evolved earlier in that period, probably 3.8 billion years ago, although it's very difficult to be sure. Fossils last billions of years, but not forever. After long enough, the chemicals they contain degrade, and it's very difficult to tell whether fossil-like structures were ever alive, even if they looked like cells. So life emerged almost as soon as it was physically possible during the 200 million years between 4 and 3.8 billion years ago. That sounds like a long time, but it's very short compared to the age of the Earth. On those timescales, life popped up practically overnight. We can understand the earliest phase of life on Earth as the evolution of chemicals. In the right circumstances, simple chemicals become more complex. As we will see, complex chemicals be become very complex. Eventually, they started copying themselves. We still don't know all the details of how that happened. For us, the point is that life is totally physical and emerges through a simple and repeatable process. Wherever conditions are suitable, life will always emerge the same way. That's good news if we want to find it on other worlds. We saw that planets start off very hot. The Earth has cooled a lot since then, but remains hot inside. So it still has several liquid or semi-liquid layers. These convey heat from the Earth's molten center to the surface via convection currents. Such currents break up the planet's crust, the hard outer surface layer, into plates and push them around the surface. The way plates move past each other accounts for most of Earth's geology, including mountain building, volcanoes, and earthquakes. This is a branch of science called plate tectonics. Most interesting for us are the places plates move apart. These are long chains of undersea volcanic mountains, generally about halfway between continent pairs that once fit together. For example, the western coast of Africa and the eastern coast of South America. These mountain chains, called mid-ocean ridges, 
are up to one kilometer higher than the surrounding ocean floor. If we took away Earth's oceans, the ridges would look like a bit of the seams of a baseball. Most of Earth's volcanoes are this underwater type. With undersea volcanoes, lava passes through the sea floor saturated with water to a depth of several kilometers. Contact with lava heats the water to up to 450 degrees Celsius. The hot water rises through the seafloor and mixes with cold seawater. How can water be liquid at those temperatures when we know it boils at 100 degrees? Actually, water only boils at 100 degrees at sea level. At low pressure, at high altitude, water boils at less than 100 degrees. Under high pressure, such as deep underground or underwater, water boils at higher temperatures. Places where hot water rises through the seafloor are called hydrothermal vents. They're not visible at the surface, so we need a submarine or special instruments to find them. Although the vents have been there since early in our planet's history, no one knew about them until 1977, when oceanographers saw them from the Alvin submarine. Volcanic seawater is rich in dissolved minerals. As the rising hot water comes in contact with cold seawater, 2 degrees, the minerals undissolve in a way that looks like smoke rising. Hence this type of vent is called black smokers. The minerals form tall black columns up to 60 meters tall. Fields of black smokers can be hundreds of meters wide. Another kind of smoker is slightly cooler and emits white colored minerals. These vents are called white smokers, but they're only subtly different from black smokers. Both types are, are quite common and associated with all mid-ocean ridges. In 2000, scientists discovered a much less common third kind of vent. They're up to 10 kilometers from the lava, so the water is considerably cooler, 150 to 200 degrees. Also, the base rocks are generally not volcanic, meaning they have a different chemistry to the smokers. The newly discovered type of vent deposits a crumbly, whitish rock rich in carbon and oxygen, or carbonate. The rock has a foamy structure. Tiny cells are separated by thin mineral walls, which let water through, but not large molecules. The rock builds up in large towers of similar height to the black smokers. From this appearance, these vents get their name, Lost City Hydrothermal Vents, or simply Lost Cities. Here, the hot water's upward movement draws in fresh seawater from the side, like an undergravel aquarium filter. So seawater constantly cycles through the Lost City Towers. What matters for us is that the water coming out of the seafloor at these places is extremely alkaline, the opposite of acidic. Regular seawater is just a bit alkaline, so Lost City Towers are highly alkaline on the inside and less alkaline closer to the surface. This gives us what's called an ion gradient. That's a zoning of ions from a high concentration to low. It gives us a flow of electrons from positive ions towards negative ions, or in other words, an electric current. Of course, hydrothermal vents supply heat energy, but their most important contribution is this very powerful form of electricity. Scaled up, it's proportionally more voltage than a lightning bolt. Since the early Earth had no free oxygen, seawater then was less alkaline than today. Thus, the ion gradient was even greater so too the amount of available electrical power. Another effect of the primordial low oxygen environment was that certain metal ions were then available in seawater which are not now. Today's oxygen removes them from seawater. These ions were then available to help make chemical reactions go faster. The reaction concerning us involves lost city rocks using the available energy to react with seawater rich in carbonate minerals and carbon dioxide. This produces hydrogen and methane. Starting with those basic units, the high temperatures, high pressures of the ocean floor, plus the circulating water, combine to create ever more complex organic molecules. It's something like old style percolators, where liquid coffee cycles through the coffee grounds getting stronger and stronger. Laboratory simulations of the process, recreating lost city conditions, have produced a series of complex molecules. Those units, amino acids and simple proteins, can go on to make everything cells need, including primitive genetic material. This series of reactions uses energy and carbon dioxide to make complex molecules.
The process is almost identical to what powers all life today, although reversed. As we know it now, the process breaks apart complex molecules to release carbon dioxide and energy. Regardless of direction, it's the same reaction. How could a geochemical process so closely match what goes on inside cells? Instead of being a startling coincidence, this fact has profound meaning. The chemical mechanisms of life arose before life itself. Earth's first living things were not independent cells as we know today. The first forms of life had none of the structures we normally recognize. No genes, no membranes. All that came much later. When self-copying chemical processes consume material from their environment in the process of copying, that's pretty close to how we define the simplest kinds of life. There is no clear separation between life and non-life. The process was completely tied to the physical structure of the lost city rock cells. The necessary molecules and ion gradient only existed inside the cells of the rock structure, not outside it in the ocean generally. How did life gradually gain independence from the vent environment? That's a very complex story and we're slowly learning the details. This first chapter in life's history left no fossils, so we have to work it out in laboratories. Essentially, each step involved internalizing the chemical and electrical processes that the lost city cells provided. Eventually, little packets of self-reproducing chemicals wrapped in oily membranes were able to leave the lost cities and continue the process independently. When the packets became full, they split apart and the membranes reformed automatically. These were the first true cells, although far more primitive than even the simplest forms of life we know. Those early cells competed with each other. Those with subtly different chemistries able to reproduce faster and more efficiently went on to make more copies of themselves than less efficient lineages. Gradually, more sophisticated cells prospered, using up resources at the expense of the less sophisticated, which died out. So our minimum ingredients list for life has become pretty short. Circulating hot water, carbonate rocks, and carbon dioxide. These are common on other worlds. So are, or were, hydrothermal vents. They probably play or played the same role there that they did on Earth. A lot of complex life is very fussy about conditions. Tropical aquarium fish, for example, go belly up if the temperature varies by even a few degrees. Some plants die if they get a touch of frost or too much direct sun. Other living things are much hardier, and here we might think of lichens or certain desert plants. However, even the toughest of these are sensitive and fragile compared to newly discovered kinds of organisms called extremophiles. The word means living things able to survive extreme conditions that would kill other life forms. They can survive heat, cold, dryness, radiation, or high pressures. A few can even take several of these conditions at the same time. The record for the toughest complex organisms yet discovered may go to tardigrades. These microscopic creatures, 0.3 millimeters long, also known as water bears, look like eight-legged caterpillars, although they're not insects. They made it through a 10-day trip to space involving near absolute zero temperatures. Tardigrades also came back from 30 years of deep freeze. They cope with cold by ridding their bodies of water in conjunction with using an antifreeze, while slowing their metabolism to immeasurable levels. Tardigrades can also survive extreme dryness, high radiation, high pressures, and temperatures over 150 degrees. They achieve this toughness via especially active cellular repair mechanisms compared to other organisms. Yet technically, tardigrades don't really live in extreme conditions, they merely have amazing capacity to endure them by switching off. Under mild conditions, tardigrades normally only live a few months. Yet still other organisms actively thrive under extreme conditions. These are typically simple bacteria-like organisms similar to early forms of life. Until the 1980s, we had no idea they were there. Extremophiles have been found far underground, for example, Miners in South Africa discovered a community of microorganisms that had been separated from the surface for tens of millions of years. 
Even five kilometers below the ground in that case, with no light, oxygen or organic molecules, the rocks contained living bacteria. The bacteria live between mineral grains, getting their nutrients directly from rock. The same kind of cells has been found pretty much everywhere we've dug underground. It's very likely that life survives in the Earth's crust all the way down to where it becomes too hot, even for this kind of life. That depth may be up to 7 kilometers below ground. How hot is too hot for extremophiles? We know some can live happily in hot water up to 120 degrees. How the microbes manage that is not fully known. At least they have chemical protection against the high temperatures and very active mechanisms which repair the protein breakdown that would kill anything else. It's not a coincidence that early forms of life were also able to tolerate high temperatures. As life moved away from the hydrothermal vents into the cooler parts of the ocean, it had less need of this ability. Only a few modern forms of life retain it. Cold is no problem for extremophiles either. Nearly a kilometre under the polar ice caps at minus 56 degrees live entire communities of microbes. Similar cold-loving bacteria had been found under Antarctic sea ice at minus 45 degrees Celsius inside glaciers and even in lakes underneath Siberian permafrost or land that's always frozen. Like tardigrades, some microbes produce an antifreeze in their tissues. Some can even stay dormant indefinitely. Scientists took ice samples from the bottom of Greenland's ice sheet, which had been frozen for 120,000 years. The meltwater revealed many types of living bacteria. Even the Atacama Desert in Peru, Earth's driest place, is thriving with life. You can't see it, but it's there, even in the saltiest sand. Certain other types of microbe can live in conditions more acidic than battery acid. Some can survive lethal radiation. If life on Earth could cope with those harsh conditions, life elsewhere could too. Martian daytime surface temperatures are similar to Antarctica. Life could also survive inside the crusts of several planets, as it does on Earth. Here, that kind of life gets its nutrients directly from carbonate minerals, and those same minerals exist on other worlds. Some of the other ways underground microbes get their nutrients should be possible on other worlds too. We used to think that life was restricted to a narrow zone around the sun where liquid water can exist on the surface of a planet. These days, that would mean Earth and nowhere else. However, now it seems liquid water can exist in plenty of places outside this zone, particularly below ground. The fact that life on Earth thrives in such places greatly increases our list of candidate worlds. The combination of a prebiotic chemical soup and volcanic energy sources is not unique to Earth. Plus, we know from Earth that living things can exist in extreme conditions where we once thought they could not, such as in volcanic vents or deep inside rock. If you'd like to keep learning about this topic, click on the next video in the series. That is about the short list of candidate worlds and what we will need to look for there. Thanks for watching.